next Sunday. Amen. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Glad Tidings. As you already know, Antonio introduced me, but my name is Lauren, and I am the youth pastor here, and I get the privilege of bringing the word today. How are you guys doing this morning? Great, great. I love to hear it. I love to get some response. My youth students, I kind of have to really, like, get them to give me a response in the audience, but if you guys can give me responses today during the message, that would make like my job easier. And that would be, it would help me know that I, I'm doing okay up here, because I'm a little nervous. Um, but, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, so today we are in the second week of our Parabolic Summer Series. And this week, we're going to be talking about the passage found in Luke 15, um, 11 to 31. And so let me just start off by reading this passage right off the bat so we know what we're going to be talking about today. Maybe you know this passage, and it is the passage on the lost son, or also known as the prodigal son. So let's read it together. It will be on the screen. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father... I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servant, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything that I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I just thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you for all that this parable represents of your love for us. God, I just pray then ask that you would speak to us today. Would we sit and submit to your will in everything that we do and even in all of our small thoughts? Would you reveal to us where our hearts are not in line with you today? In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, this is a very famous parable. Many of you have probably heard this parable before, and some of you might be thinking, oh, we already know what this is all about, Lauren. Like, we already know that this is a parable about the love of the Father more than it is about what the sons did We are never too far gone. God loves us always and welcomes us back into his family with open arms no matter what we have done. 
And while this is all so true, by God's grace today, I hope to offer us a new perspective of how we can interpret this parable. And if you are new and you're hearing this passage for the very first time, it is so exciting because this passage really does open up the text for us and open up our eyes for who God is and who we are. And I believe it will give us a deeper understanding of our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. To give us some context today, um, the parables would have been spoken to a group of people called the Pharisees. And they would be to help Jesus himself explain why he is doing things the way that he's doing them, which would seem so wrong and so countercultural to the Pharisees. He used these parables to almost justify his behaviors. One of those things that he justifies is by being a person who welcomes sinners. He welcomes them and wants to be close to them. He wants to touch them and he wants to hug them and he wants to eat with them. The Pharisees would have been shocked by this. The main purpose of this parable is to show God's attitude of pardoning love towards sinners, stressing divine mercy that exceeds all expectations. So let's now take a little bit of time to go over each section of the parable. So the first, it starts with, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Let me start off by saying that this parable is written for both sons. Both had a relationship with God at the beginning. Both fell into their own sinful nature and desires and distanced themselves from their father. One did so while living at home while the other did so away from the home. But it's important to note that both of them broke the father's heart. Now, the fact that the younger son was asking the father to give him his inheritance early would have been extremely offensive to the father. It was basically saying to the father that he wished, the son wished his father was dead already. Like, imagine one of your kids, if you have kids coming up to you and saying to your face, like, I just want you to die already. That would be so offensive and we'd be so hurt and maybe even angry by our kids sharing that with us. But we know that what our human response would be. And I want to look at what the father's response was. It says that the father agreed. No anger, no punishment, no yelling. And if you're a parent to littles, not even any timeouts. He just agreed to give him his share early, his share of the wealth. The father didn't punish him for his rebellious heart. He just granted him his wish in that moment. Already we can see a kind and gracious father. He was a prodigal father before the son had ever even left. He forgave his son of his rebellious heart, of the mine, mine, mine attitude and the give me, give me, give me mentality before his son even took it. Before we even take a step away from God, he already has forgiven you through his son Jesus Christ. It says next, a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. The son took only a few short days after he had been given the wealth to take off. He would have been given about one third of the wealth. The second third would be for the other son. But he would have taken off only a few short days later. The son took off and left his relationship with his father. He left his father because he didn't see his father being able to offer him anything valuable in his life anymore. He got the inheritance that he wanted and that's all that he needed out of their relationship. He took off. When children value God for what he can do for them, they truly miss out on one of the greatest blessings of all time, which is truly just an intimate relationship with him. Maybe you are finding yourself in a place where your relationship with God is transactional. I, you know, I will live here until I get my blessing and then I'll move on. Or I'll come to church and I'll pray or I'll be a part of this small group until I get that financial blessing. And once I have that, I can provide for myself and I can take care of my family. Maybe your relationship with God is transactional. 
Maybe you find that you are seeking the blessing of your relationship with God rather than simply hungering for a relationship with him, God himself. He went off, left his father, and lived a reckless life, and in no time at all, he, he lost it all. He went off and, and lost every bit of his inheritance. When we value God for what he can do for us more than an intimate relationship with him, we start to fulfill our own selfish desires rather than just simply enjoying a relationship with God, the only one who truly fills every desire of our hearts. There's a great book called Experiencing the Father's Embrace by Jack Frost, and it talks a lot more about this idea if you want to study more into this idea. He was so ashamed to go home right there. You would think, oh, if, if you had lost everything, wouldn't you just immediately go home? But he was so ashamed. He was afraid of what the people would think when he returned home. What would his friends think? What would the neighbors think? What would his older brother think? So he allowed himself to get to the point of starvation. I think we can learn something about that today. Maybe we are causing someone to question if they should confess. Not because um, they are worried about how God will respond, but they're worried about how the people closest to God will respond. How will we react when they come and confess? See, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. He was jealous of the pig food. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. When he finally came to his senses, or another translation says, when he came to himself, William Barclay pointed out that so long as man was away from God, he was not truly himself. He was only truly himself when he was on the way home. Man is never fully himself until he comes back to God. Coming to ourselves is one of the greatest compliments that God could give us. Because even though it might be painful, it always draws us right back to him. As long as we are away from God, we are never fully ourselves. And it has to take a moment of realization that we have strayed away in order for us to actually return back to our father. The younger son had to reflect on his condition in order to recognize that his desperate condition was a result of his sin. It says next, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he got to the point of, okay, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I need to come home. I will finally go home. He came to this conclusion because he must have started to remember what his life was like when he was in a relationship with his father. He came to the realization that it was so much better than what he was experiencing in that moment. His father was his provider. He was his protector. He was someone who loved him unconditionally, who was gracious and kind towards him. A father who isn't easily angered and keeps no record of wrong. It was in remembering this that he knew he needed to go back home. That was the only right response for him in that moment. Maybe you are far from the Lord today and you are being reminded of his character and what it was like to once be in a relationship with him. The son then started to practice what he was going to say to his father when he arrived home. He was practicing his confession. I remember one time when I was little, my friend and I were spying on our neighbors in one of the upstairs rooms in our house, looking out the window, and there was a lamp right beside the window. And as we were spying and peeking out the window, we broke the lamp. It fell off the table and it shattered all on the ground and it made a loud crashing sound. And I remember turning to my friend and going, what are we going to say? What are we going to say? We need to come up with something we're going to say to my parents when they find out that we broke this lamp. And so we instantly started practicing what our confession was going to be. We're, we're practicing over and over. No, that doesn't sound good. This sounds better. Like, let me, let me make sure I have it right in my head. And so we heard, like, my dad's footsteps coming up the stairs. And we're like, oh, no, we don't have something yet. Like, think quick, think quick. 
And so we finally came up with something, but we were practicing our confession because we wanted to make sure it sounded okay. We made ourselves sound a little better than we were, but we also knew we had to tell the truth because it was eventually gonna be found out. We had to practice it. Maybe you guys are practicing some of your confessions today. See, in the son's confession, we see that he was willing to be the lowest servant in the house of the father. He was willing, he wasn't willing to stand another day away from his presence. That must tell us something about the love that the son had experienced from his father in the past. It continues, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. His father saw him coming because he was waiting for his son to come home. He was anticipating the return of his son. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servant, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we had been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. The father's response was immediate rejoicing. He forgave the son, no strings attached. The son didn't even get to the part where he was going to ask to be one of the hired servants. The father interrupted him. It says that the father ran to him, he embraced him, and he kissed him. This was countercultural at the time because the son would have been so dirty in his old clothes, so dusty from the long journey he just took home, and even spiritually dirty from all the sins that he committed while he was away. But the father wasn't concerned about that. He embraced him anyways. This is the symbol of the father taking on the son's sin as his own. Because when you touch someone who was unclean like that, the sin was transferred to you. Isn't that what Jesus does for us? We are never too dirty, we are never too unclean for Jesus himself to welcome us back into the family. He then gave him a robe that stood for honor and a ring that stands for authority and shoes that represented freedom. Daryl Johnson has a sermon on this parable and I was listening to it this week and he pointed out something that's really cool about the ring. The ring would have been a signet ring. The ring is the one that is used to seal all of the father's official documents. He says that the son who squandered one third of the family wealth is given authority to manage what remains of the family's business and the family's fortune. He then gives a prophetic question in, this, in his message. He says, what is this? Are sinners gonna be leaders in the kingdom of God? Are tax collectors going to manage the treasury of the household of God? See, I believe that God is not done with us yet. I believe God's not done with us yet. God takes back repentant sinners with zero hesitation. In our minds, sometimes this doesn't make sense, and that's why this parable could be better known as the parable of the prodigal father giving away his love freely and extravagantly in a way that doesn't seem to make sense to us. He is ready to pour out undeserved blessings of grace and mercy on our lives. The father didn't want to receive his son back as a servant. He wanted to receive him back as a son. God wants to receive you back today as a father or a son. He doesn't want to receive you back as a servant, but he wants to receive you as one of his own children. But what about the other side of things? I think we need to be more like the Father in the way that we forgive others. God doesn't say he forgives and then still holds sin over our heads. He forgives no strings attached. The slate is wiped clean and he celebrates with us. When others confess to us, what is our response? Is it anger? Is it resentment? Is it holding a grudge? If it is, it really shouldn't be. That's not the response that the Father gave to us, so why should we give that response to others? 
Now, there are times when people wronged us, and it doesn't mean that everything goes back to normal when someone confesses to us. Sometimes we need to build trust again. Sometimes we need to set boundaries in our lives if that person has shown a pattern of hurt. But what does the response look like in our hearts? Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all of these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. The older brother was angry. Even though the younger son coming home didn't affect the older son's inheritance, he still had his two-thirds of the, of the, the wealth that he had. More than even the younger brother had originally, he was still angry. The brother stands for the self-righteous Pharisee who would rather see a sinner destroyed than be saved. Do some of us have that spirit within us? I remember a number of years ago, I was talking to some people in my life about this exact same thing. At the time, there was someone in my life who distanced themselves from the Lord. And in turn, it really hurt me with some decisions that they made. I remember saying to a mentor, what if one day this person comes back to a relationship with God? Do they get to go to the same heaven that I get to go to? Like, how is that fair? They hurt me so much. I tried to live for God every day. Even though I know I wasn't perfect, I tried. That person didn't even try. But I've learned that that's not what it's about. Just like the brother, I was trying to be obedient to the Lord, not out of loving service, but out of grim duty with no joy attached. And that's never the way it was meant to be. I long for the day that that person will come back to the Lord and I will rejoice when that happens. It says next, his father said to him, look dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything that I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Even the older brother was right. The younger brother didn't really deserve a feast. He didn't deserve a party, but he failed to understand the father's love. He has no understanding of forgiveness and compassion. The father loves both of his sons. Just because he embraced the younger one doesn't mean that he forgot about the older one, doesn't mean that he loved the older one any less. You see, both sons broke the father's heart. He did not love God, and he did not love others, his brother. He was self-righteous, pointing out the sin of his brother, but not recognizing his own. He did his father's will in action, but he did not do it from the heart. He failed to see that he himself also needed a savior. It's the wonder of the love of God that he treats us the way that he does. The love of God can defeat the deliberate rebellion of the heart. Jesus welcomes those who come to the end of themselves and repent. But repentance means a change of heart, which in turn will show a change of action. It's moving from a give me mentality to a change me mentality. We can't just repent and continue to do what we were doing all along. That's not true repentance. Turn from your old ways. You are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So live like it. It doesn't mean you will be perfect, but it means that every day you will try your best to submit to the will of God for your life. See, we all have the capacity to break the Father's heart. We have the capacity, even in small, tiny ways, to distance ourselves from the Father. We think to ourselves, oh, that would never happen to me. I would never lie. I would never steal. I would never commit adultery. I would never gossip. I would never you fill in the blank. But look at the examples in the Bible. The sons distanced themselves. 
even though one was still home, still in proximity to the father, he was still distancing himself. He even broke the father's heart. So I think we all need to recognize that with our sinful nature, any of us have the capacity to give into temptation, bitterness, jealousy, coveting, and so much more. The want to live for ourselves and our personal satisfaction. When we do that, we realize that we are hurting ourselves, we are hurting those around us, and we are ultimately breaking the Father's heart, the one who matters the most. We are putting a wedge in between our relationship with God, and if we don't come to the end of ourselves, if we don't come to our senses, then we will continue to grow further and further away from him. I want to take a moment to speak to those who feel that they can relate to the son who ran away from home, who abandoned all relationship with the Lord for a period of time. And I have good news for you today. The good news is that based on this parable, we know and can have a better understanding of the Father's heart for us when we do come back to him and recognize what we have done. No matter how big, no matter how small, the Lord has the same response to us when we come back to him. So if you're here or you're listening to this message online and you feel that you are far from God, I believe God wants to extend his love for you today. He is waiting with open arms, ready to embrace you. He doesn't offer shame or guilt. He just wants to offer you a new way, a better way, a way that is the way he designed, full of grace, full of mercy, full of forgiveness. God, out of his mercy and love, sent his son Jesus to be the perfect example of how we were designed to live, and he became a human sacrifice, never once sinning, but living the perfect life and bearing the weight of all of our mistakes, suffering the most painful and excruciating death on the cross so that we could be forgiven, so that you could be forgiven, so that we could be cleansed, so that our slate could be wiped clean. Our Father doesn't hold us to our past mistakes when he thinks about us. We are a new creation. We can be truly free. If that is you, I want to pray for you in just a moment. But I also want to speak to those who may be like the son who stayed home but still broke his heart. Those who are in close proximity to God but still have things in their lives that are pulling them away from him. If we're honest, I think everyone in this room has something, myself included even if it's just something small. The reality is that all sinful actions are birthed out of small thoughts. Thoughts that are not addressed continue to build and they, and they fester. It may be slowly or it may be quickly, but it still builds. So what safeguards are we putting in place to protect against the growth of these, these sinful desires in our lives? There can be many safeguards that we put in place, but I think one that can be the most effective is the practice of confession. None of us are perfect. And I know that each of us will fall into sin each day. I'm studying the Ten Commandments with our students right now. We're doing a summer series on the Ten Commandments. And every day and every week, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that I am subject to failure every day. It's a miracle that we have Jesus. I also know that when we confess with others, it sets us free. Confession and repentance is the beginning to freedom. When the younger son came home, he got to the end of himself and he repented to his father. James 5.16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we confess, we get to experience the true love of our Father. Confession is so important for us. God forgave before we even sinned. Before we even came to our senses, he forgave us. Before we had even admitted what we had done, he forgave us. He forgave so confession must actually not be for God, but it actually must be for, our, for us and for our hearts. For our hearts to be realigned to his will. I want to share with you something that I was strongly sensing as I was preparing for my message. As a body of Christ, we are called to fellowship with one another. And true fellowship isn't just community that laughs together, has fun together, and simply eats a meal together. I think it goes deeper than that. 
It goes as far as aligning ourselves with the way of Jesus, supporting each other, holding each other accountable, rejoicing with one another, weeping with one another, and confessing with one another. I am sensing that this is actually what the the Church of Canada needs a little more of, maybe even the Church of North America. He is calling the church, the followers of Jesus, to be this type of place. People who come to their senses every single day, recognizing that their thoughts and actions didn't align with those of Jesus. A people who are humble enough to admit it. A people who are experiencing the love of the Father every single day. A place where we are supporting each other, holding each other accountable, confessing to one another, rejoicing with one another, and weeping with one another. I believe God wants us to be a place and a people that can be set free from so that we can be set free for. Set free from our sins so that we can be set free for doing the will of God. Set free from the baggage that we are carrying so that we can be set free to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Set free from those small, even little, simple thoughts that we have that have, that have not even made their way into action yet. But then so we can be set free for truly flourishing in the way that God always designed. The way he always intended. So let's be a church that commits to getting rid of our self-righteousness. And we come to the end of ourselves where we are humble and recognize that we all could end up like one of the two sons. So we set up guardrails for ourselves, one of those being confession, so that those things we are hiding no longer hold any power of guilt or shame over us so that we can be freed to flourish in the way that God always designed So that we, when we do this, we can rest assured that our Heavenly Father will without a doubt welcome us back into his family and wipe our slate clean. It's good news. So I just want to pray for you now, if that's okay. Would you guys just bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place? I want to take a minute to um, pray for two different groups of people. Maybe you are like, uh, you're feeling like you relate a little bit to the younger son. Where maybe you have been far away from God. I just want to pray for you today. But I also want to pray for those who feel like they might be like the older son. Maybe you're in close proximity to God. Maybe you show up to church every week and you volunteer in our services. You help out in some way. But there might be a sin that you're hiding in your life. Maybe there's even just small thoughts that haven't even turned into action and don't even seem like they're a big deal. But they're small and they're still there. I want to pray for you today. So God, I just thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your grace. God, that I know how heavy the weight of our sin can feel sometimes. But God, it doesn't always have to feel like that. Because, God, with you, you offer a new way, a better way. A way that is free from all of that baggage and and that guilt and that shame. When we repent to you, Lord, you have a better way for us. You wipe our slate clean. And, God, one day we will stand with you in heaven at the throne and we we will get to worship you wholeheartedly with nothing holding us back in our past. We will be free. God, I pray that you would help us each experience your freedom here on earth before we even get to heaven. God, there is a way that you designed us to live here, and God, would you help us do that? God, would you help us be humble people where we can humbly say, God, I am not perfect. God, would you help me rid myself of those thoughts that I had today? God, would you help me protect my relationship with you so that in turn I can protect my family, I can protect the people around me, that God, if those sins turn into actions, that God, it would break so many hearts, more than just yours. So God, would you help me protect myself? God, protect us, Lord. God, would your covering be upon us, Lord, each and every day so that when we're walking out into this world, God, we, have, we are clothed with your righteousness. God, we're clothed with your authority. God, help us submit to your will each and every day.
because that's the only true way that there is to live. It's the best way to live. We know it, Lord. We thank you for what your son Jesus did on the cross so that we could experience this. We thank you that imperfect people like myself can still share your good news with others. How many more people in this room do you want to share the good news with today? How many more people in this room do you want to use to share the good news to others in this world? God, would you start with us in this church? Start with us so that we can continue to grow your kingdom here on earth. We love you, Jesus. We submit to everything that you are. Help us be more like you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would like additional... Thank you. If you would like any more additional prayer today, I know the weight of our sin can feel heavy, but it doesn't have to feel that way. If you would like any prayer, our prayer team is going to be just out this back exit into the room next door so you can go to them and pray, for, pray with them, have somebody to confess with. Let's practice this in our church today. Let's be a church that has true fellowship with one another. Have a great week and God bless.